I drove up to my astronomy club's dark sky site today because tonight the scene conditions are going to be some of the best we've had in months. So even though it's midweek, I had to take advantage of this opportunity. The area we're in tonight is a Bortle Class 2 light pollution zone, which means the Milky Way is bright and absolutely breathtaking. The observatory is only about an hour from my house, so it's well worth the drive for the simple fact that I could do much longer exposures than I could ever attempt from the city. Tonight, we're going to be photographing a target that has always been one of my favorites, Messier Object 33, the Triangulum Galaxy in the constellation Triangulum. At approximately 3 million light years from Earth, M33 is actually one of the most distant deep sky objects visible to the naked eye. Including the Milky Way and Andromeda, this face on spiral galaxy is in our local group of galaxies. Because it's so close, it has a relative size in the sky approximately two and a half times the width of a full moon. Now to photograph M33, I'm going to be using something a bit more sophisticated than in my past videos. Why don't you come with me? I spent years imaging with what I would call a very budget-friendly astrophotography setup. You know, I really took my time with this hobby, and I perfected skills in setup and polar alignment, photographing every target type I could find, acquiring those calibration frames, and learning the software side of this hobby for stacking and post-processing. So, after trying out that ED80 in my last video, this last year, I made a few upgrades. But we got a big night ahead of us. We'll start with a tour of my setup, and we'll discuss and review each item that you see here. Then once the sun sets, I'm going to demonstrate how guiding impacts your images by taking a series of unguided and guided exposures at different exposure lengths. We're going to take a look at those images, and you'll see the results for yourself which is going to lead us into our five-hour imaging session tonight. And finally, I'm going to walk you through the process that I use for gathering those dark, flat, and biased calibration frames. we got a lot to cover. Let's get started. This is the Orion Series EQG go-to equatorial mount sold by Orion Telescopes and Binoculars. You know, if you're looking to get a go-to equatorial mount for astrophotography, this mount, or its nearly identical cousin, the HEQ-5 from Skywatcher, would make an excellent choice. Now, as it turns out, the Orion version is available here in California, so I went with that option. This go-to mount features the SenseScan hand controller with this database of 42,900 objects, which I'm actually still using for controlling the mount. The mount features three ports. The first is the hand controller port for the SenseScan controller. The second is the port for the power source. And the third, the SD4 autoguiding port, which connects the mount to the autoguider. The mount has a retractable counterweight shaft, which really simplifies storage and transport. An 11 pound counterweight, an illuminated finder scope, one and three quarter inch stainless steel legs, and a built-in bubble level. With the counterweight, the mount weighs in at 43 pounds, and with a payload capacity of 30 pounds, it easily handles my 14 pounds of imaging gear. Now, while some still consider this mount in the entry range for astrophotography, the mount tracks and guides amazingly well, and with the three-star alignment, the accuracy of the GoTo system has never let me down. While I may eventually install a more permanent equatorial pier in my backyard, I'm always going to keep this mount for taking on the road to the monthly star parties or to my club's outreach activities. This is the Explorer Scientific ED102 CF FCD100 F7 Carbon Fiber Apochromatic Airspace Triplet. The FCD100 version of the ED102CF is an upgrade over Explore Scientific's Essential Series version. Now both the FCD100 version and the Essentials version have an aperture of 102 millimeters and a focal length of 714 millimeters. One main difference between the FCD100 version and the Essentials version are that this version includes Hoya's FCD100 ED glass, which is very similar to a Hera's FPL53 glass used in other top refractors. Now, to compare to the ED80 Essentials I featured in my last video, the differences in color and contrast with this glass are very obvious to me. The sky is more black, the finer details are more apparent, and the color is much more vibrant. This version of the 102 also has the more robust 2.5 inch hexagonal dual speed focuser. With the coarse and fine focus adjustment, 
as well as a focus lock screw. The scope is a work of art. The images produced are breathtaking and the weight of the carbon fiber OTA works perfect with the serious mount. Next up is what Orion has labeled the Orion Magnificent Mini Deluxe Auto Guider Package. This is a package deal from Orion. It includes the 50mm guide scope with the helical focuser, the Starshoot Auto Guide monochrome camera, and all the cables you need to connect the camera to your mount and your laptop. What I like about this set is that once you install the needed drivers from Orion's website, the scope and guide camera combo work essentially as a plug and play with the PhD guiding software. The guide scope and camera are actually one of the presets in PhD2, and this really simplifies things. The pixel size of the camera works well with the focal length of the guide scope, and this combo works amazingly well with the mount and provides very accurate guiding, which you'll see for yourself tonight. With this mount and guide camera combo, I've tested single exposures up to 25 minutes, all with pinpoint stars. Now, for astrophotography, this opens the door to a long list of deep sky targets. For those of you who have spent 30 minutes or longer like I have trying to get that perfect polar alignment, I think you'll appreciate this. This is the Polemaster Polar Alignment Camera from QHY. Before I made this purchase, I was actually very skeptical of the claims and reviews. After using the polar alignment camera myself, my skepticism is completely gone. You know, the software which runs this camera is one of the simplest astrophotography programs that I've ever used. And in just five minutes, I'm able to achieve by far the best polar alignment I have ever achieved by using the mount's polar finder scope alone. I have to say, this is a must have for astrophotography. Now, can I guide without the pull master? Of course, and I did for years. But this handy little camera saves me a ton of time, which I'd rather use for imaging. Next is the Explore Scientific Field Flattener, T adapter, and the 50mm extension. I discovered that while the scope does come with two of these threaded extensions, for visual astronomy, your eyepieces will only reach focus if one of the included extension tubes are used. However, two extension tubes are needed to reach focus with the Explore Scientific Field Flattener and the DSLR. You know, I really did not want to have to add and remove that extra threaded extension every time I wanted to switch from photographic to visual. So I put some thought into this, and I tested a couple of different field flatteners and a couple of different extension tubes. The solution I came up with is just to use one threaded extension tube along with the 50mm 2-inch extension and the Explore Scientific Field Flattener. You know, this seems to work well, and after imaging all night, I can easily remove the camera and finish up with some visual astronomy while my DSLR is taking the dark calibration frames. I'm still using my unmodified Canon T6i for deep sky astrophotography. Now, the reason I've not modified this camera is that it's my multi-purpose camera. I use it for both daytime nature photography as well as my nighttime photography. You know, this camera has served me well for quite a few years. The sensor has pretty decent low light performance and actually has a higher effective ISO compared to imaging with its predecessor, the T5i. Now what that means is that you can shoot at a higher ISO with less noise. And at 24 megapixels, I can pull that much more detail out of my images. When I do eventually upgrade to a dedicated astronomy camera, I'm still gonna use this camera for my Milky Way and daytime photography. You know, when I pulled my old Dell laptop out of the closet and dusted it off, I wasn't sure if it would work for astrophotography. I'm still running Windows XP, and what I found is that for polar lining and guiding, the laptop works perfectly. And even with a 4GB hard drive, the laptop provides more than enough power to run both the Poolmaster and PhD guiding software. This brings me to an important note. Before you plan out your imaging system, make sure that you have drivers readily available for what you plan to use. Now, I'm going to be upgrading my laptop later this year, which means I'm going to be able to use programs like Backyard EOS, Sequence Generator Pro, or Astrophotography Tool. For tonight, I'm going to be using my intervalometer for camera control and my Batten-Off mask for focusing. To power the entire setup in the field, I use a 90 milliamp deep cycle marine battery inside of this Minkota case. 
The case features two 12 volt ports, which I use for powering both the laptop and the mount, a power indicator meter, and wires directly to the battery. This is a great setup, and the battery will run both the laptop and mount for several nights of imaging. Well, the sun's gonna be down in about an hour, and I've got a hot meal in the works. You know, the forecast is right, the skies are really, really clear. Now, I have a feeling this is gonna be a great night for astrophotography. We'll be back after it gets dark. People often talk about the benefits of auto guiding and how you can achieve much longer exposures with pinpoint stars in greater detail than you could ever achieve without guiding. And that's great, but what does that look like in the field? Well, before I calibrate PhD, I'm first going to take several unguided test shots of our target. Now keep in mind, this mount was polar aligned with the pole master, so your results may vary depending on the mount that you're using and how you align that mount. With that in mind, I'm going to take a one minute two minute, three minute, and just for fun, let's do a five minute unguided test shot all at ISO 1600. I'm gonna start that sequence right now, and I'll be back with you in a moment to look at the results. The series of unguided exposures are all done. Let's start with the one minute exposure. Okay, take a look. The low surface brightness of M33 means that even at 60 seconds, this deep sky object is still very faint. Okay, I've zoomed in all the way. Let's take a closer look at those stars. As I've experienced with this mount and focal length, with a one minute unguided exposure, the stars still look good. Let's take a look at the two minute exposure. The image is definitely brighter, but there seems to be quite a bit of blurring. I'm going to zoom in on that two minute exposure and take a closer look at the stars. Yep, yep, there's definitely trailing. Take a look. At two minutes, the stars are already showing significant trailing. And while the image is brighter, fine detail in the galaxy is completely lost due to tracking issues. Well, I've also taken a three minute and five minute unguided exposure. Let's take a look at those. Here's the three minute unguided exposure. And here's the five minute unguided exposure. Now to give you a better perspective of the impact of no auto guiding, let's do a side by side compare of the stars and those four unguided images. At one minute, the stars still look good. They are all points of light with no trailing. But at two minutes, we can start to see how minor imperfections in mount tracking and the lack of auto guiding become evident. This issue is even more apparent as we progress to three minutes and even more so at five minutes. In a moment, I'm gonna complete the PhD guiding calibration procedure and we'll take our next series of guided test shots. Now, if you don't already know, the acronym PhD when it comes to guiding, literally stands for push here dummy. And you know, honestly, while the program does offer many advanced features. Once everything's connected and the camera drivers are installed, to start guiding, it's actually quite simple. Typically, there's only about five or six buttons to click, and then a completely automated 10 minute calibration procedure. Now I can go through the more advanced features, guiding steps, and some troubleshooting techniques in future videos, but for now, I'll complete the process and I'll be back when we're guiding. Okay, the calibration is complete. Let's take a look at the graph. As you can see, we're locked onto a star and PhD is making minor corrections to tracking as indicated by the graph. The spikes in the line graph indicate guide star movement in both right ascension and declination, each designated by its own line color. Now this movement can be due to atmospheric conditions, minor imperfections in mount tracking, and many other factors. The small bars that you see in the graph indicate pulse commands sent by the laptop through the guide camera and then to the mount to keep that guide star on point. 
Well, the numbers look good. A total RMS error of only 0.24 indicates that the star movement in the tracking process is extremely low. And that's good, since the mountain has to work less to track that guide star. Yeah, that's going to work quite well for tonight. Let's do a three minute, four minute, five minute, and let's go ahead and do a 10 minute guided shot all at ISO 1600. Now the sequence is going to take us 22 minutes, but as long as we did everything correctly, and I think we did, I think you'll find the results interesting. I'm going to turn off the slide and we'll do that now. The guided exposures are done. First up is our three minute exposure. You know, even in the single three minute exposure, you can see detail in the spiral arms radiating out from the galactic core. Oh, that's an amazing image. Let's zoom in on that three minute exposure and take a closer look at the stars. Okay, take a look. As you can see at three minutes, the stars are still pinpoints and look really nice. Let's take a look at the four and five minute exposures. Here's M33 at four minutes. And here it is at five minutes. And quite a bit more detail, but also quite a bit more noise. Finally, let's take a look at that 10 minute exposure. Now normally, because of the noise level, unless the outside air temperature was well below freezing, I would not image at this exposure length, or even at five minutes. The noise level at this temperature is just too high for my taste in an uncooled camera. But even so, what an amazing single exposure. Now for comparison purposes, let's zoom in and take a closer look at the stars in that 10 minute exposure. Okay, take a look. As you can see, the benefits of auto guiding are very clear. Here we have a 10 minute single exposure with pinpoint stars. Now earlier during our unguided exposure test shots, we were only able to achieve this result with a one minute exposure. For M33, the plan is to take 100 exposures at three minutes each at ISO 1600. Now 100 exposures at three minutes each is gonna give us five hours of data. And that's actually a good start to make a somewhat decent astrophoto. Now, my guide graph looks good, so I'm going to turn off this light and we'll start that sequence. What am I going to do with the next five hours? Well, I brought along my Dobsonian, my astronomy binoculars, a lot of coffee, and a list of targets, both NGC and Meze objects. You know, while I do really appreciate the go-to functionality of my equatorial mount, I still enjoy the hunt and challenge of locating deep sky objects on my own. It's three in the morning and my light frames are all done. Now after my last video, several viewers asked that I show how I take my dark, flat, and biased calibration frames. So I'll do that now. Flat frames are used in the stacking process to remove not only the impact of small dust particles from your imaging system, but more commonly and more importantly, the impact of vignetting, or the uneven distribution of light from your lens across your camera sensor. Now this effect is going to make your images appear brighter in the middle and darker out towards the edges. Now since flats are the most dependent on nothing shifting in the optical train from your main imaging session, we'll start there. I wanted an easy way to take flat frames on demand and in the field. I ordered this drafting tablet off of Amazon for about $20 and this power bank for about $20 as well. Now to build this, I simply measured and cut three holes. One to match the size of the dew shield. The second to match the location of the power button. And the third for the power cord. Let me show you how to take those flat frames. Keeping the same focus and camera position used in your light frames, place the light box over the dew shield and turn it on. Now, if you have a Canon DSLR, you're gonna to wanna to turn the dial on the camera from manual over to AV. If you have an icon, this mode is instead labeled with an A. They both stand for aperture priority. With this mode, 
All of the other settings used in your light frames will remain the same. The camera will determine the proper shutter speed to properly expose the frame. Let's do a test shot. Okay, let's take a look at the histogram. Okay, take a look. As you can see, the camera determined the proper shutter speed to be 1 160th of a second, which places the image data on the histogram at approximately in the middle, slightly to the left side. This looks good, and it's going to work just fine for our flat frames. So I normally do about 20 of these, so I'm going to start that sequence and let the camera do the rest. Next up are the bias and dark frames. Now, neither of these actually require that the camera be attached to the telescope, so... I'm going to remove the camera and set it aside for this step. Let's do bias frames next. Bias frames are used in the stacking process to remove the impact of the electronic signal coming from the camera itself. Now this signal creates artifacts in your images, which are also called hot pixels. And these often appear as small red, sometimes green or blue, pixel-sized dots on your exposures. Now to take these frames... Set the camera back to manual mode and use the same ISO as your light frames. Now you're going to want to use the fastest shutter speed your camera offers, and in my case, that's one four thousandth of a second. And make sure you block all stray light. Now I've programmed the intervalometer to take 50 of these shots, and they'll go fast. So I'm going to start that sequence and let the camera do the work. Now let's move on to the dark frames. Now dark frames are used in the stacking process to further reduce the amount of noise in your final image. Now the amount of noise in your image varies, and it varies with the ISO you're using, your exposure time, and the outside air temperature. So to take these frames, you want to keep the ISO and exposure length the same as your light frames, and take your dark frames at the same temperature that you took your light frames. And finally, as with the bias frames, make sure you block all light sources. Now I've got 20 individual 3-minute dark frames programmed into the intervalometer. And while the camera is doing the work, I'm going to go ahead and put away my equipment. Well, that was a great night up in the mountains. I gathered all the image files I needed, stacking and post-processing is all done. Let's take a look at the final image. I hope you enjoyed the video. I had a great time, and I hope you did too. And remember, if you want to see future videos, please click like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.